I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is John Wertheim, a sports journalist and author who has a passion for psychology and economics. John is the executive editor at Sports Illustrated, where he's been a full-time staff member since 1996. He's also a contributing correspondent on 60 Minutes and an analyst for the Tennis Channel at the Four Tennis Majors. John is the author of 10 books, including Strokes of Genius, about the Federer-Nadal tennis rivalry, the New York Times bestseller Scorecasting, and more recently, This Is Your Brain on Sports. Our conversation spans across sports, behavior, and decision-making, discussing John's path to a career in sports journalism, an insider perspective on tennis, the role of luck, cycles in basketball strategy, loss aversion, job preservation, omission bias, sports gambling, the business of sports, and lessons from interviewing. John moves with ease across sports, investing, and psychology, and the parallel of his anecdotes and the world of investing are both entertaining and readily apparent. I'd like to thank Peter Taboris from Strong Point Wealth Advisors for sponsoring our podcast dinner series. Some of your favorite guests gathered again last month and kicked off an engaging dinner by answering the question, what have you learned recently that most struck you? The answers were so good that we collated them for distribution. Thanks again to Peter and Strongpoint for their gracious hosting of these events. Today's show is also sponsored by Manny Friedman and EJF Capital, who have in mind a fascinating way of getting your attention on an investment opportunity. Manny and EJF are so passionate about the future development of the U.S. through qualified opportunity zones that he asked me to find a way to urge people with taxable gains to take a closer look at these investments. The government came out with the next round of regulatory clarifications on April 17th, And we now have answers to frequently asked questions that may have prevented investors from diving in previously. EJF has a fund that is investing in a bunch of projects across the country, but Manny's sponsorship isn't about his fund specifically. It's more about getting the word out so this innovative government program can be successful. The incentives for taxable investors in both real estate and new operating businesses in Opportunity Zones are massive, and if the program scales, it has the potential to transform economic development for the better in a way that may be bigger than any of us can envision. So that's it. Manny's trying to spread the word and get smart folks to pay attention and find investments in Opportunity Zones. EJF's fund is one possibility, and there are plenty of others too, but please take a look if you haven't already. If you want to learn more, have a listen to my podcast with Manny about the Opportunity Zones. It's episode number 91. Please enjoy my conversation with John Wertheim. John, great to see you, bud. Good to see you. This was fun. Well, why don't you just start with your background and how you got started in this business and go from there? Oh, man. We got to define our terms. I don't even know what business I'm in anymore. Well, you and I knew each other in college. I went to law school. I took a year off, went to law school, which was sort of a path of least resistance move. You know, you're 22 years old. You're not quite sure what to do. Well, law school is always safe. I loved law school. I met my wife in law school. I, I was in at Penn in Philly, and Elizabeth Warren was on the faculty. It was a great time. I just had no interest in being a lawyer. And I worked one summer in a law firm and have never looked at my watch. Clock watching is not just a metaphorical term. And I just said, boy, I got to figure out another game plan. I can't do this for the next 40 years. And I lucked into an internship at Sports Illustrated. They needed someone who had a legal background. This was after Mike Tyson. And this was, I guess, 1996. I think they had come to this realization that sports and the law was going to be an increasingly busy intersection. Wouldn't it be cool if we had someone who knew the difference between a charge and a conviction and knew how to get papers at a courthouse. So I started sort of as a legal intern and 
This was the tail end of the golden age of magazines. Sports Illustrated was this high-flying entity that took the staff to Atlanta on private planes and had these crazy retreats. And Sports Illustrated essentially paid for my last year of law school on the condition that I worked there when I graduated. So it worked out great. I finished law school, took the bar on a Friday, and I think that next Monday I started at Sports Illustrated and hard to believe in this day and age and in this media environment, I'm still there. And I've sort of been able to, again, as media has changed so much, one of the nicer changes is that things have really opened up in terms of moonlighting and freelancing and working elsewhere. And when I started, if you wanted to do an NPR interview, you would have to jump through hoops and get signed approval from a manager's manager. And now I think there's much more of an acknowledgement and a reasonable policy that as long as something isn't directly conflicting, it probably helps all of us if you branch out. So I've been here. We're doing this interview at my office at 60 Minutes. I've been here for a few years and I do work for Tennis Channel and write books and sort of have a number of proverbial... It's a diversified portfolio, you might say. (laughs) Well, let's dive in a little on sports and then we'll turn to kind of that intersection of sports and business. I thought of reaching out after watching the documentary of Strokes of Genius. And I know you've been writing about tennis forever. And, And the one question I wanted to start with was, what nuances do you understand about tennis having followed it and traveled with it for a long time as you have that someone who enjoys it and watches it on television wouldn't quite understand? Tennis is sort of, I always say it's my guilty pleasure, but I I really have a a fondness for tennis. I cover a number of sports. I mean, obviously tennis is not covering the NFL. It's not going to get you the biggest following. It's not going to draw the ratings of the NBA or the NFL or college football. But I, I think tennis is just an extraordinary sport. I'm really drawn to individual sports. I also like cage fighting, UFC. Don't tell my wife. But people say, how can you like tennis, which is this, at least notionally, image-wise, this elegant upper crust sport? How can you like cage fighting? And to me, the similarities, the Venn diagram is significant, that there are a lot of similarities. So I think the individual nature of tennis is really special. Even in boxing, Every three minutes, you get someone to give you instructions and give you encouragement and give you water. I mean, tennis, you're totally out there by yourself. It's men, it's women, it's teenagers. It's, you know, Roger Federer is a 37 year old father of four, and he'll very easily be playing against an 18 year old. And Serena Williams' upbringing is completely different from Rafael Nadal's upbringing. And everyone approaches the sport differently. It is known as this country club sport, but it really, at least at the professional level, very few players come up that way. And you have this international cast, age, you've got veterans, you've got rookies, you have this whole mix and everybody comes together to play this crazy sport and then they do it alone. And to me, it's just so revealing what it says about players, what it says about human nature, what it says about decision-making and behavioral biases and what people... uh do under pressure, it's all right there. So I think sort of the explanatory powers of tennis are so strong. And then you marry that with this incredibly diverse, dual gendered global cast. To me, it's one of the great, if we're going to stay in business terms, this is one of the great under leveraged assets. I mean, this sport to me has so much going for it. And sometimes it's heartbreaking that the sport can't seem to get out of its own way. And sometimes I love the fact that it's kind of this, everyone knows tennis, but it's still a little bit of uh, a secret in plain sight. And if it got much bigger, I think my relationships would change. I mean, the nice thing about covering tennis is you get to know everyone. And if you want, are you an NBA fan? Yeah. So they're, they're the Oklahoma City beat writer, biggest paper in the state. He covers the thunder. And someone said, well, what's Westbrook like? What's Russell Westbrook like? I don't, I don't know. I've never spoken to him. Does the Boston Globe... Patriots writer have much of a relationship with Tom Brady. Unlikely. Maybe he talks to him a few times during the season. But with tennis, it's completely different. And one of the nice things about tennis is that it's big enough so that it's on TV, it's legitimate, there's an appetite for it, but it's small enough so that you really get to know some of the players. So you mentioned Strokes of Genius, the Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer book. We sat down with them and did long interviews with both of them. And I wouldn't say we're friends, but we're certainly friendly. There's a cordiality. We didn't have to pay them fees and we didn't have to sign away crazy rights. 
so covering a sport where you actually can have a relationship with the athletes is really meaningful to me. And I don't think that necessarily exists so many places anymore. Yeah. I have to dive right into this question of, you mentioned decision-making and behavior, and there's obviously parallels with everything in decision-making. So what is it about decision-making on the tennis court? It's just so situational, I think, a lot of times. And there's some real parallels to investing yeah, well, and you dive, well, right, dive ideas right <laughs> of momentum and there's ideas of, of risk reward. And why don't you serve two first serves? Why are you hitting the ball so safely? And do you play differently at 40-15 than you would at 15-40? And when you're the favorite and you're expected to win, how does that impact your shot selection? And when you're facing an adverse set of circumstance, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff about momentum and the player's risk appetite and their uh, reward threshold and how that changes based on the score of the match. I think a lot of it is not necessarily something that conforms to analytics. I mean, a lot of times you can just see a player choking and making bad decisions, making bad investment decisions, panicking when the market is turned. And sometimes there's a pattern and sometimes you can see it. Other times you just see it with your eyes and it's very much intuitive. But again, I see a lot of life encapsulated in a tennis match. How much of data analytics have come into the way that professional tennis players sort of think about those decisions? This is not a, uh, a strong sport for that. You know, and, and I suspect we'll talk about the book I wrote about scorecasting that's very much grounded in analytics. And in some sports, I mean, the NBA, the analytics are unreal. I feel like there's been a little bit of blowback recently where there's a sense that people have become too dependent on analytics and it's a balance. I mean, at some level, the information is always going to help you, but can also help too much. And part of sports is that it's unscripted and unpredictable, and you don't want to really stifle creative impulses. And you have to balance that with making sound decisions, which I think, again, that's a parallel to investing, I suspect. Tennis does not do very well on the analytics front. And I don't know if that is just, it hasn't thought creatively. I don't know if it's the fact that it's not like, you can rig up an NBA arena and you're good for 40 days, right? I mean, this is a circuit. So it's in Barcelona this week as we're recording this. And next week, they'll be in, in Madrid and then Rome. And it's very hard to sort of standardize data. But I also think a lot of tennis is really hard to capture. If you serve 90% of your first serves, well, that's an extraordinarily high number. Ted must have been having a tremendous serving day. Or was Ted playing too conservatively and hitting the ball into the middle of the box and not taking chances, and that 90% is misleading? So I think a lot of tennis data really depends on the framing and needs a little bit more context. And I think also there's so much that goes on in a tennis match that is emotional and mental, and it's about controlling moments, and it's about someone in the crowd with a kazoo you want to shut up. I mean, there's so many factors that can impact a match that are really hard to account for. Some players study, I mean, Andy Murray, I mean, some players try to learn from data and other players want nothing to do with it and don't pollute my uh, creative impulses by putting ideas in my head. And I don't care if my opponent serves a certain way when they're down break point and serves a different way when they're up game point. Some players really resist it and other players embrace it more. I think it's definitely a continuum within tennis. Yeah. At what point in time, as you're covering sports, did you start diving into behavior and analytics? I always liked sports. I was never a hard, hardcore sports fan. I mean, people are always disappointed when they come up to me and they hear what I do and they say, who should I draft in my rotisserie league or who should I my fantasy picks? And were you surprised that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers picked so-and-so in the second round and I sort of have to either fake it or just confess that I like sports. I don't live sports. I mean, to me, always what's interesting in sports is I think I told a boss, I, I like sports and. So sports and economics, sports and the law, sports and psychology. So I think from the beginning, I never had to really cover up beat. So I was never the guy who went to 100 baseball games a year or only did the NFL. I always was sort of a generalist and I always sort of tried to write and watch sports with a plus one. And it always more about the game and more than the athlete. I think I had the good fortune that I never had to be the NFL guy or the college football guy. So I think pretty early, 
the games are interesting and sometimes they're very dramatic and sometimes they're not. And the athletes can be very interesting and sometimes they can be very boring. But really from the beginning, I mean, again, especially since I was sort of hired under this guise of covering sports and the law, it was always about more than the game. That sounds really trite. But no, I, I think early on doing this job, it was always about what can sports explain beyond what everyone can see reading a box score. In the books that you've written, are there a couple of either stories and research that you've done or lessons that really stick in your mind as kind of the most interesting ones that you found? Yeah, I mean, I guess it varies from book to book. Some books I've done for different reasons, and sometimes you know, I wrote a book about pool hustling, which is probably has fewer lessons, or at least practically speaking, than score casting. The Federer Nadal book you mentioned has always stuck with me, especially now. I think it's especially resonant that these guys, Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal, probably greatest rivalry in the history of men's tennis. They'll probably, if they retired tomorrow, it would probably rank one, two as the best players of all time. They're completely different. They came to tennis differently. They play differently. It's lefty. It's righty. It's Western Europe and Mallorca. I mean, there are a hundred contrasts, but at the end of the day, they're really a lot of similarities and one of the rare rivalries where it seems totally normal to root for both of them. You, you wouldn't say I like Harvard and Yale or I think Max and PCs are both awesome. You pick your tribe and it says something about you and you don't budge and you build a case for you and against the other guy with Federer and Nadal, it's completely normal to like both of them. And I think one of the reasons is that very early on, they recognize that rivalry ultimately benefits both of them. And Nadal may deprive me of a few titles and Federer may deprive me of a few titles, but ultimately I'm better off for having this guy in my life. And they've shown that you can compete against someone and have a rival and you can compete fiercely. You can really, really want to beat that guy, but he doesn't have to be an enemy. And but obviously it's taken on perhaps a significant amount of resonance lately where it doesn't seem like you have a lot of instances of that. But I think the fact that you can have this rivalry, but also respect the guy, be friends with the guy, and even genuinely appreciate that he exists. That's something that stuck with me. I mean, you mentioned scorecasting and the book I did subsequent to that, Your Brain on Sports. I mean, that's there are different kinds of lessons, but no, I, I will never look at luck the same way. I will never, uh, we, I don't know if we want to talk yeah, about let's, loss let's, aversion. Sure. And well, let's walk, I don't let's know. walk can, through uh, some of it. You yeah, know, exactly. st start with luck. And so what did you learn and see about luck when you say never think of luck the same way? Yeah. I mean, luck in some ways is, is really anathema to sports, right? We work hard and we game plan and we strategize and we compete and we sweat. We don't want to think that this is just in the hands of fate or coin flip. I mean, in some ways, luck is very much at odds with these core values of sports. And I think same with investing, right? We like to have an investment strategy. We like to do our research. We don't want to think that we're throwing darts at a dartboard, right? But luck plays a real role and people tend to fail to completely understand luck. And I think one of the things we wrote about in the book was this idea of slumps and hot hands and streaks and a baseball player goes 0 for 8 and says, boy, I'm really struggling. I'm in a slump. I need to change my bat and not wash my socks. And and you want to say, well, you hit 300 and you have 600 at bats a year. So you're getting 180 hits. At no point does it say those have to come one hit every third at bat. It's completely within coin flipping probability that you'll have eight heads before you have a tail. Stay at a roulette wheel all night, and it's completely reasonable that you'll have four reds, and it doesn't mean you're due for a black. So I think this idea of sort of seeing everything in terms of streaks and slumps and not in terms of individual isolated occurrences, it's something in sports, but in real life as well. And again, I think we really resist this idea of luck. We want to think that we control our destiny, and there's a reason and an explanation, and it's too hot out, or I ate bad sushi for lunch, or I'm really feeling it. I had a good night's sleep. We don't like to think that, you know what? You flip a coin 600 times, you're going to have eight of one and none of the other. But luck, I think, plays a bigger role in sports and probably other aspects of our lives as well than maybe we like to lead on. The hot hand phenomenon, I know you had written about it in scorecasting. And just relatively recently, there was sort of a very sophisticated mathematical study that showed, indeed, there is a very small 
statistical hot hand. I saw, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it's that. kind of amazing because yeah. anyone who's played any sport feels like, yeah, there are times where you feel like you can't miss a basketball shot, and there are times you feel like you can't make it. Yeah, this is all hearsay, but apparently Obama read this book and said, like, those guys lost me when they tell everyone that plays basketball knows there's some days when you're feeling it. Totally. But, you know, expand that sample. And those hot days figure into your overall pattern. So, again, I mean, a guy takes hundreds and hundreds of shots. Steph Curry takes hundreds and hundreds of shots in the course of a season, shoots 50%. It doesn't mean miss, make, miss, make, miss, make. And he can have a hot hand. He can feel it. But is it that? Or is that just, again, think of coin flips and what the sequences are going to be for that? I mean, making eight shots in one day and feeling great and feeling like you can't miss still, I think, doesn't disprove luck. Basketball, you mentioned earlier, the way the game of basketball has changed through, I guess, data is amazing. Like you're watching the playoffs and these guys are taking three-point shots from who knows how far behind the arc. What's your sense of where basketball is going? You know, what's interesting to me is sort of the, the chicken and egg of it. I mean, when we were kids, what did everybody do? You go, you try to be Michael Jordan and you try to dunk. And if the guy was 6'6 and athletic, inevitably he was the next Jordan. And those were the players that got drafted. Then it became more about the centers. And now we're back to this era of shooting. And I think this era is driven by analytics, by, yeah, a three-point shot that you shoot at 38% is a better shot than the two-pointer you shot at 44%. And, I mean, what we see in the NBA now between James Harden's shot statistics and between Curry and exactly, a guy takes a step-back 37-footer at the buzzer, who's a point guard, by the way. I mean, this is a guy who's... In another generation, what does he do? He penetrates, and then he either dishes or takes it himself. But no, I, I never thought we would be debating on whether a uh, a step-back 37-foot shot at the buzzer when you've got 10 seconds left to set up a play would be considered good or bad. My question, I don't know the answer. Have people said, listen, the data says more and more threes. These mid-range jump shots are worthless. It's a, a dunk or a three-pointer. We need more perimeter game. Has that led to this value we put on the three and Steph Curry and Harden and having no problem. I mean, I'm doing a story next week on a college player that averages about 11 three-point attempts a game. Larry Bird, great shooting Larry Bird. He would go games and games without attempting a single three-point shot. So is is the data breeding this new player that is unlike us working on their getting on a nine-foot hoop and trying to dunk, but instead you take farther and farther shots and you see kids at the gym and they're shooting from half court because that's how Steph does. Is the data changing the way players play or is this sort of Steph Curry mold encouraging us to examine the data of shooting from farther away? Yeah. I also wonder about the relationship of the fan in the game because in basketball, if you're having outside shots and dunks, it's pretty exciting to watch. If you change that over to baseball, it's home runs and strikeouts and that's pretty boring to watch. I wonder if something about the three-pointer is that you and I can do it I can have a shooting kind. I mean, I've shot from half court before and I can go out there with my son and we can see who can make the most shots from 25 feet. We're not having dunk contests. I think baseball has a number of problems that go beyond home runs and strikeouts, pacing and time of game and demography. But no, it's interesting. I mean, I think you're right. What do we think about when we think about basketball? The dunk is the, the pinnacle moment and everyone... Cheers for a dunk, and that's what they show on the highlight show. Strikeout versus home run seems to be a less sexy proposition. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things you've written about in your books that really do cross over to investing. And one of them starts with this concept of sports are the difference between popular decisions and smart decisions. At some level, that folds into loss aversion as well. And this idea that we hate the prospect of loss more than we like the prospect of gain. I think. Some of sports, we just have this conventional wisdom that also is wrapped up in job preservation. So the real goal for some of the decision makers, including the managers and the coaches, is keeping their job. Well, there's no quicker way. Losing games is the quickest way to lose your job. But the next way is to make boneheaded decisions or to be considered a cowboy. So that really, I think, stifles creativity and decision making. And so a lot of times in sports, you end up with decisions being made that actually don't maximize your chances of winning, but what they maximize is your chance of keeping a job. So if you're the free throw shooter and you shoot 
68. I mean, the free throw shooting is an interesting thing on its own, right? Because I think there's sort of an element of machismo and, and image tied to that and what underhand represents. And str- I mean, I think that's an interesting example. But what would you rather do? Shoot 60, 68% conventionally and 72% but be known as the underhanded free throw shooter. We see that in investing as well. There's a risk reward threshold that we all consider when we make uh, investing decisions as well. I mean, something we talked about that I wonder, I mean, it's sort of the, the same conversation is just this notion of omission bias and this idea that somehow if we make a mistake by removing ourselves from a situation, that somehow becomes less culpable than if we affirmatively make a mistake. So let's give you an example. If you're a fund manager and you put your client's money in an airline stock that goes down 20%, that's a really, really bad mistake. If you miss an IPO, you miss the Amazon IPO. That ultimately is going to cost a lot more money, but that's an omission, right? That's an error of not doing it. Somehow that is less culpable. So we see this with coaches. We see this with decision-making on going forward on fourth down. Somehow this idea of making a mistake by error of omission, right? I think in the book, we use the example of uh, the official that doesn't call goaltending on the last play of the game. That is preferable to imagine calling goaltending and then having the camera show that it really wasn't that's a much more grievous error. And I think loss aversion and omission bias are two things that in investing and also in sports have us making some really suboptimal choices. But like shooting overhand free throws, at least we're on the right side of convention. I was reading your book, there was a discussion of the relationship of the fan with the team. And I was reading it got me thinking about how I felt about the investment managers that I had given money to, where effectively you're rooting for them in some way. You want them to do well and and what that biases mean. Talk a little bit about what you saw in kind of a fan rooting for their team. Yeah, we t- and I should also pause to acknowledge my uh, collaborators in both of these books that I should have done earlier. Toby Moskowitz, who's a childhood friend of mine, now at Yale and also at AQR Hedge Fund. And Greenwich was my uh, co-author on scorecasting and Your Brain on Sports was written by Sam Summers, another another great guy from the Midwest who's a professor of psychology at Tufts. Yeah, we invest a lot of ourselves in this idea of being a fan. And some of that is these are our warriors and they represent our schools and our values. And we make a statement about ourselves, but also they're real pragmatic, functional, material ways that rooting affects the way we lead our lives. And there are a number of studies that people have more confidence in their ability to do tasks when their team wins versus when they lose. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which our identity is really wrapped up in these fans and athletes that we root for. And yeah, it's the same way with a money manager. And at some level, there's the stakes are a little different in that financial price versus these self-esteem issues. But yeah, I mean, it's always about more than... I think one thing that's going to be really interesting that's very much in the space that we're talking about is this idea of sports gambling that is proliferating and has really moved in from the margins. I mean, if someone said, what are some of the biggest changes since you've covered sports? Social media and the internet is the first one, but I would put this very, very um, changing. I, I would say evolving views on sports gambling as another significant change. But I think this sports gambling, when it's not just I love the Pirates, but I have money on this game, I'm not rooting because I admire Steph Curry. I'm rooting because I have a financial stake in the outcome. I think, A, that's really going to change the fan experience and this team-athlete-fan relationship we're talking about. But I also think the data that's going to come out of this is going to be really fascinating. And I think some of these behavioral biases we're talking about are really going to be expressed in the gambling data that's going to be really interesting. And your sense is that's going to explode with the broader legalization of gambling, not just that it exists in Vegas. Yeah. I mean, right now I know people that were in midtown Manhattan and I know people that will drive across the George Washington bridge, activate their William Hitler sports gambling app, play sports books, which you could geotag. So you can do this in New Jersey and then they'll drive back across the bridge. I mean, I think that pretty soon we're going to, be at a place where sports gambling and in different iterations is going to be legal everywhere, that we're not just betting on point spreads and whether the Patriots are going to beat the Jets, but we're going to be betting during the game. 
Are they running to the left side or the right side? Are they passing? Are they running? Is Steph Curry making this free throw, missing it? I mean, I think this is going to be everywhere very soon. It's all going to be mobile. And I think it's really going to change. I go pretty libertarian on this. I don't have any real moral issue with it, but I think, A, it's really going to change the way we consume sports. But I also think the data and what all of these billions and billions of data points coming out of sports gambling, what they're going to say about human behavior are going to be fascinating. Do you have any hypotheses of what's going to happen? I think people are going to lose a lot of money based... I mean, this will be very familiar to you. People that place bets based on emotion are going to get burned. I think we're going to have a lot of conspiracy theories. I think there are going to be very few winners. And I think like investing in general. I think there are going to be winners that are going to emerge and there are going to be models that are going to prove successful over the long term. And I think this is going to be divided into a very, very small subset of people that are doing this with discipline and research and responsibly. And the Floyd Mayweathers who wake up feeling like Duke's going to win the NCAA tournament. So I'm just going to throw money on Duke, but it's going to be fascinating to watch. What have you learned in following and covering the business of sports? It's exploded in the 20 years or so I've done this. A lot of that is based on technology and media and the fact that there's still an appetite for live unscripted programming. And there are TV shows that I love and watch, and I can't even tell you what network they're on. I'll watch it when I watch it. I'll watch it on the treadmill. I'll binge it with my kids. I mean, nobody, sports conversely, you want to be there. I mean, the experience, the beauty of it was watching this unscripted act play out live. It's going to be interesting to see. I mean, sports has been propped up to a great degree by these media rights and these media contracts. When that model changes and we're not all paying for cable and when ESPN doesn't necessarily make the billions it does from subscriber fees and therefore doesn't have the billions of dollars to throw at the leagues who therefore don't have the 51% they're going to have to pay for the players or whatever the revenue split is in that sport. I think that's going to change. But sports have really exploded. I mean, I did a story for 60 Minutes last week on the Warriors. And this is a franchise. I and mean, the Golden State Warriors, not that long ago, was just a brutal, just a dog shit franchise. Golden State Warriors are now worth probably in excess of $4 billion. That's 10x what the owners paid for it not that long ago. Some of that is a success of the team. Some of that is playing in San Francisco. They're moving to a new building. But a lot of that is the media rights. And what happens when the media contracts that have propped up so much of sports and so much of these ancillary industries and the player salaries, when that changes and the networks don't have the subscriber fees? And I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how that changes the business of sport. It's funny because in some ways... Games are games. And the beautiful thing about sport is there's a certain level of continuity, right? I mean, you could have been asleep for 20 years and watch baseball today, and you might not notice the players, but with a few small exceptions, the teams are the teams, and you still have an American League and a National League. The rules haven't changed much. In some ways, there's real continuity to sports, and in other ways, they're unrecognizable. What have you learned about interviewing in all the years you've been interviewing people both live and doing research for stories. It's an ongoing process. No one has mastered the art. Terry Gross perhaps being an exception. I mean, no one's really mastered the art of interviews. Everyone is different. But I think sometimes the most brief questions and the longest listening yield the best answers. Notice I'm allowing the space to fill. No, sometimes allowing space to fill and let the person you're interviewing fill that vacuum. I think there's a temptation not just with interviewing, but you want to sort of go in there and build rapport and connect with the subject and show them how much research you've done and how smart you are. Sometimes the simplest questions and then just listening to the answer and not jumping into your next bit of dialogue yields the best the best responses. But one thing that's been interesting to me that I've realized is that there's a big difference between a print interview and a TV interview. And that for print, a lot of times you want good quotes, you want to be able to paint a portrait of the subject you're interviewing, but no one's listening to your interview, right? So you could have 
a horrible conversation for 29 minutes. And if the 30th minute the subject opens up or gives you a, a couple of nuggets that are interesting, you're smiling when you walk away. With TV, where the interview is at least at 60 minutes, the interview is part of the package. It's a different rhythm. You don't want to interrupt. You don't want to overtalk. You're much less interested in something that it's a completely different rhythm to the interview. So I would differentiate between a print interview and a TV interview. But something that's taken me way too long to learn is that sometimes less is more and a simple question and letting the subject fill any silence is better than jumping in and trying to prove that you belong to be at the table. Did you have a moment or an example where you got something out of a conversation just by being brief? I did an interview a few years ago for 60 Minutes Sports Show, which is how I started here at 60 Minutes, with Marshawn Lynch. And I was sort of warned in advance that this guy's a little bit different and he doesn't like to give interviews. And I went through the transcript when I was done and I realized that, again, when I just sort of sat there, it yielded the best material. And it was a TV interview, so you don't want to interrupt the other person. You really want them to speak and say what you want them to say and sort of let it be their interview. That interview and reading that transcript was really... I mean, again, this this came 20 years into my career. I mean, these interviews are tricky, and it's much trickier when you're doing it with two cameras. And you can interrupt me, and I can interrupt you, and we have a great conversation. If we're doing this for TV and we're talking over each other, that's not good TV. Do you have any memories of a particularly tense moment in your interactions with athletes? I'll give you a good one with taught me something, too. So I'm doing a story on... Tom Ricketts, who became the owner of the Chicago Cubs. This was maybe 2009 or so. And I interviewed Marlon Byrd and said, ah, you know, I'm just doing a story. I'm curious your thoughts of your new owner. The guy glared at me. I kind of sort of knew who Marlon Byrd was. I don't know. It seemed like I'm sitting there in the clubhouse. I said, is there a problem? He said, well, I talked about this. I said all I wanted to say in spring training. And I said, well, I wasn't there. Can I ask you again? Can you give me some thoughts on your new owner? I just was hoping to ask you a few questions about new ownership. And he said something impolite to the effect of, are you deaf? I just told you. I said all I was going to say in spring training. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm too old for this shit. I'm never going to cover this team again. I'm just trying to do this goddamn story on the owner, who, by the way, was lovely and agreed to talk. So uh, it wasn't anything great expose. And I sort of said to Marlon Bird, look, I, I hear what you're saying, but you don't have to be an asshole about it. And he said, yeah, I'm sorry. I just, sometimes I just get asked so many questions. I'm sorry. What can I do for, let's talk about it. And he ended up having a nice conversation with the guy. So there's the cheesy high school, you know, the after school special message, stand up to the bully. But at the end of the day, what you realize is that this is a lot of times about a connection and these athletes, I think at some level respect being confronted and having a real conversation and the athlete media relationship is very strange. It was when I started. It's probably more so today. But if you can just have a normal conversation, I think that goes a long way instead of the fawning, Ted, great game. Can you talk about that play in the third period? I mean, that's not going to yield much of a rapport. All right, John, I think I could go on and on, but I know you're a little time constrained. So I want to leave a little time to turn to some closing questions. First one, what's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? One thing about media today is that it really doesn't stop. I really love writing. I guess I'd say writing. I mean, I'm working on a book now, and it's almost like I have friends that will play golf or do crossword puzzles. This doesn't seem like a job. I mean, it's just something I enjoy. I would do it on a beach. I would do it you know, when I have an hour on Sunday morning and the kids are still asleep. I still really enjoy writing. The notion of doing something you don't like is just baffling and horrifying to me. So honestly, I come to work and I rather enjoy it. I go home and I deal with work stuff and it never really seems like work. So what's the next book about? The next book's about the summer of 1984 in sports when a lot of crazy things happened in retrospect that didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but from Jordan getting drafted to Lakers, Celtics to... Donald Trump buying a football team and then seeing a 
leak go to waste to uh, a profitable Olympics. A lot happened in this 90-day window that seemed pretty normal when you and I were yeah. young teenagers, but that still echo today. So it's a fun nostalgia book. What's your biggest pet peeve? I'd say arrogance. You don't see Mid- any of it in your line my of work. Midwest <laughs> upbringing in me. No, I just bragging and self-promotion and arrogance is distasteful. What have you learned recently that stuck with you? I think like what you do. When I worked in a law firm and sort of reported home and said, yeah, I don't see myself being a lawyer for the next 40 years. All right, well, what do you see yourself doing? I don't know. I'll figure it out, but not that. It wasn't met with great resistance. I mean, I was lucky to have a a father in particular who really liked his job. And you spend a lot of time at work and you spend a lot of time. I mean, 40 hours is a myth. Your job is a big part of your identity and your day. And just as a sheer math exercise, the waking hours you spend, the notion of having a job that you're not challenged by and passionate about is something really sort of scary and baffling to me. And whether it was implicitly or explicitly, this idea of just do something you like was something I'm really grateful to have received. All right, John, one more. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? Resist action bias. I mean, sometimes doing nothing, sort of the Warren Buffett investment model, but I think it applies to a lot more than investing. I mean, sometimes doing nothing, sometimes firing, you know, switching jobs. I mean, sometimes uh, the grass isn't always greener. And I've seen a lot of coworkers leave for other jobs and then wish they hadn't done it. And I've seen people leave spouses and realize in retrospect that wasn't so wise. And you know, just smaller everyday occurrences too, right? I mean, I bought a bike, I didn't like it, I sold the bike, and boy, I wish I hadn't sold the bike. So I think we have a bias in investing, we have a bias in life, we have a bias in a lot of our decision-making to just do something. You ever hear the, the med school, one of the great, don't just do something, stand there? I think too seldom, and I've learned this the hard way, and I've witnessed other people learning this the hard way, too seldom do we just stand there. We always feel like we need to uh, get in there and try and time the market or get in there and try and find a better job. And it's remarkable how often standing on the sidelines might have been the better course of action. John, this was so much fun. Great to see you. Thanks for taking the time. Anytime. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 